Welcome to the car guys and this week at last we have the Porsche 911 992 GT3 specifically popular YouTuber Roger Bailey's GT3 and amazingly this is the first 992 GT3 that I have ever driven and this is my 991.2 GT3 Touring one of my daily drivers and probably the finest 911 that I have ever driven or owned how similar are these cars to drive? How different are they? That sounds like something we should look at in this week's episode. So this week, I'm gonna enjoy the latest iteration of the GT3 on some incredible Welsh roads. We'll look at all those external and internal details, and of course, a sprinkling of flat six beans. And since it's only just happened, we'll probably have to touch on the new GT3 RS2. Sound good? Excellent, let's do this. This is the Porsche 911 GT3, model designation 992, and it's been out for ages. In fact, it was launched in April 2021. Why has it taken so long for this channel to get one? Why am I covering it now? Why didn't I get one? And why on earth would you spend time watching me talk about it now? It's taken this long because A, I don't have one, and B, I was frankly a bit bored of it. YouTube coverage reached saturation point, everyone seemed to have one, and really, what is there to say about a new GT3 that you can't already predict? Will it be better than the last one? Yes, most likely. Are you able to actually buy one? Absolutely not. And would you pay a hundred thousand pounds over list for one? Uh, no. So I kind of thought that a car guys episode on the 992 GT3 might be a bit uh, irrelevant. But then I spoke to Roger Bailey, who was lucky enough to get one of these cars thanks to his close relationship with Porsche Center Chester. So hi, I'm Roger Bailey. This is my GC3. You'll see it on my own YouTube channel. And Damien has been begging me for over 12 months to get a drive of this car. So in the end, I just had to relent. Shh, don't tell him that. I thought this might be the perfect time to compare the new 992 with my 991.2 in his backyard. And perhaps at the same time, take a look at this whole privileged Porsche allocation system. How did I get an allocation for this car? Well, I will tell you, but tune into my channel where all will be revealed. And there's a link in the description below. There's, there's no link, is there? <laughs> got the link. <laughs> Despite what some of you might think, I was not ever going to receive one of these 992 GT3s even before I made that video about poor client service at my former Porsche authorised dealer. He's just pissed off that he didn't get a GT3, a few people who didn't bother to watch the video properly said. Well no actually, I knew I wasn't getting one of these cars because I hadn't played the allocation game properly and I didn't want to have to buy cars that I really didn't want just to get the odd ones that I did and that almost certainly means that I'll never own a new Porsche again. But what that means for you, cherished Car Guys viewer, is that you get the opinion of someone who isn't a corporate shill, or someone so desperate to get the next special Porsche that they're too afraid to speak candidly. Put simply, I can say whatever I want. So that means this week you're going to get a complete unfiltered, unimpinged view of this 992 GT3 versus my older generation touring. And I'm hoping that's something you might be interested in. Okay, so it's really hard for Porsche fans to get these cars because they only make so many of them. But that doesn't answer the whole question, does it really? Because dealer principals, they've got to choose who actually gets one of these cars. And an average sized dealership will get an allocation of five in any 12 month period. So who do they give them to? And it's not just the dealer principals that choose this. Did you know that Porsche themselves actually get involved with the procurement process now and the dealer principal has to justify his choice or her choice 
to the factory itself. So let's have a look at these two cars together and do a good old fashioned walk around. The biggest difference obviously between these two cars is the fact that the Touring has no wing at all and the new GT3 has that enormous huge swan wing on it. But there are other differences as well, notably in the bonnet or hood where the new car has got these additional grills here cut right into them and it's got a more aggressive sort of cut down the middle of it as well. The 992 obviously has that new nose, which is slightly more angular than the 991.2, which is more rounded. You can see here, you've got two big cutting grills, whereas this one's got more of a smiley joker face. My 991.2 has got steel brakes. The calipers are painted red, whereas Roger has very sensibly gone for ceramics and he's had them painted black so that they're not too garish against the blue paint. The rear end of both cars is dramatically different. The new 992 obviously has that huge Knight Rider LED light strip at the back and it's got a huge and very prominent diffuser. It also has a large amount of black plastic here on the top of the engine with contrasting struts for the wing itself and it's interesting to note that Roger seems to have the same condensation problem on the back of the lights that I've got on my 718 Spider. Another thing that's immediately apparent is that the rear end of the 992 GT3 is a lot more aggressive and bulbous. The previous generation, which we all thought was really aggressive, next to this car actually looks pretty timid. But I guess the biggest impression I'm getting from standing between the two cars is just how stealth the 9912 touring really is. Yes, it's bulbous, but it's low to the ground and it's smooth all over. There's very few telltale signs that this is a special car. The badge on the back, and if you know what you're looking for, you can tell from the stance. But with the new car, there's no getting away from it. This is an aggressive looking car. It's got snorting nostrils. It's massive and wide. It's shouty. And in this shark blue paint with neodyne wheels, it does look incredible. One of the main reasons why I absolutely love this car is because with it being a GT3 and on track it is fabulous. PDK gearbox is unbeatable on the track and it makes an average car driver look really good on circuit. The 992 GT3 is certainly a striking creature but now that I've had time to look at them next to each other and now that I've also had a year to absorb this shape I'm not quite sure which one I prefer. I think I might prefer the older generation. I think it might be slightly less fussy. And I'm not just saying that because I own the Touring, it's actually the 991.2 GT3 RS with the Visac pack that I think is the perfect evolution of the 911 GT car. Sitting next to the Touring, it does indeed look a bit bigger. And in my book, a bigger GT car is possibly worse. Damien thinks the uh, the previous generation looks better than the, the current generation. I don't agree with him, he's actually wrong there. I think the new 992 actually looks better. It's sharper, it's more modern, more aggressive looking, just as it should be. So let's have a look at the engine of the 992 GT3, shall we? And there you go. That's it, that. This little tiny compartment with a pressure release cap is all you get to see. You don't even get the back of the spoiler lifting up. You get just that. It's unbelievable. The only way to get to the engine is by removing the back here and going from underneath. Like all modern Porsche 911s, you can't actually see the engine, but trust me, deep in the rump of this state-of-the-art GT car is a four liter flat six naturally aspirated dry sumped engine. It's got forged titanium piston rods. It's got six individual barrel throttle bodies and it revs to 9,000 RPM. And it promises to be incredible. It's virtually the same engine as used in the GT3 Cup cars and the same lump found in the 2019 911 Speedster. And you can mate it to either a six speed manual or a seven speed PDK. And that's a decision that's made many prospective owners completely vexed. Do they go for everyday convenience and improved speed of the PDK or a deep connection with the machine using a stick shift. Interesting to note that Roger has gone for PDK. Performance is brisk, but not game changing. And this is the first time that I can remember that Porsche has not continued to chase ever higher horsepower. 
The 992 GT3 puts out 503 brake horsepower, that's 510 PS, and it has a peak torque level of 347 pounds-feet, or 470 newton meters. That gives you a 0-60 time of 3.7 seconds and a top speed of 199 miles an hour. That's 320 kilometers an hour. Porsche has kept this car pretty much the same as the previous generation in terms of power, but it's the aero that gives you the real-world gains on the track. Here's a comparison of the performance stats of the 991.2 and the 992 GT3. As you can see, surprisingly, there's only a 10 brake horsepower difference in power between the two generations, and the torque figures from essentially the same engine are also predictably similar. Since both cars weigh roughly the same, that means a slight advantage in acceleration for the 992, though the top speed remains the same thanks to aggressive aero. Now that swan neck rear spoiler, and I have to confess, I'm not a fan. I sort of kind of hate it a bit. It might be more efficient, but to me, it's just annoying. It's got too many parts on it, and I much prefer the simple spoiler. Although, as we can see from the GT3 RS that's just been announced, you can go way too far. The GT3 RS, the new upcoming 992 GT3 S, is not at all what I expected. There's no front boot. It's a very aggressive car. Uh, the suspension looks like it's going to be rock hard. But interestingly, it's got controls on the steering wheel that can alter the rebound and settings of the suspension, which actually could possibly soften it all up. But we'll just have to wait and see. Whilst I appreciate the aerodynamic and technical improvements of the 992, it's only really the double wishbone front suspension with integrated helper springs, anti-roll bar and ball jointed suspension mountings that really stand out in the spec of the new car. Why? Because it's the first time for any 911 that it's been fitted and it truly aims to cure the initial understeer during hard and tight cornering and it promises to transform the handling but more about just how much of a difference that makes compared to the Touring later on. Let's have a look at the inside. Oh, here we are then, and yes, it is as difficult to get into as my car. One of the great problems of having really nice looking racing seats, just like these carbon backed beauties, is that they have very high supports on the sides and that can really chafe your thighs when you get in, if obviously you're not exactly the slimmest of gentlemen. I've tested two 992 911s, the Turbo S and the C4S, and I've gone on record raving about the design, the functionality and the ergonomics of the interior. It really is world class. You've got digital dials ahead of you, a large central touch screen, and it all feels a lot more luxurious. The choice of materials, the tactile nature of the controls, the way that the touchscreen and the physical buttons blend together perfectly, there's nothing like it. And the GT3 is the same, but more purposeful and, what's the word, cool. Everything has been thought about in a very high degree, something you would expect of the Germans. Behind me I've got a half roll cage called a club sport cage, carbon back seats, but just look at it, even though this car has done 5,000 miles, it still looks brand new and Roger has obviously kept it in good condition. But you could argue that it's a bit too refined and cosy for a GT car, which I always think should be properly stripped out. I think the interior is absolutely spot on. It's not too refined for a GT3 at all. The special feeling starts when you actually climb into these bucket seats. As soon as you climb over these edges, you realise you're actually in something special. Now the interior materials here developed by Porsche is called Racetech. I don't want any of you saying Alcantara because it's not. We've got a Racetech steering wheel on here which I think is appropriate for this type of car and you'll notice yes it's a PDK so you've got a faux gear stick and you've obviously got that switchable transmission so you can control it with the paddles or with the stick. Compared to the 991.2 though this is super space age. What a difference a generation makes. The 991.2 cockpit looks bare and basic compared to the 992's flight deck. Here is the comparison, and even in terms of materials and design, even Stevie Wonder would agree that the 992 is far superior. The manual stick dominates, simple buttons litter the central tunnel, the touchscreen is much smaller, though it's still a joy to use. This car has a liberal sprinkling of carbon, leather and plastic. There's definitely no race tech here yet. 
You'll also notice that I've replaced the Dower black seat inserts with these houndstooth ones from the 911R. My car has red dials in the classic 5 configuration that 911s have featured since the 1960s. The wheel is unadorned with controls and is a simple three-spoke affair. These important car dynamic controls fall naturally to hand and sit just below the gear stick. The stick itself is short and stubby and perfectly weighted. It's all very functional, Germanic, efficient and proven. The interiors of 911s can date horribly. 996 anyone? But this 991.2 is plain, simple, business-like and somehow it suits the GT3. Right sports fans, it's the first drive in the 992 GT3. So first impressions, it feels incredibly well damped, it's relatively stiff, it's quite noisy and the steering is um, razor sharp. Immediate improvement over the touring in terms of response and feel. But what's surprising, given how refined the interior is, is actually it sounds pretty agricultural. A lot of noise, a lot of mechanics going on. I can see why Roger often has to wear his noise-cancelling headphones when he's in this car, because it is pretty noisy. People talk about how jiggly and stuff GT3s are and how maybe they're not tuned for the road, but what's interesting about this car is that the suspension, steering and everything is perfectly tuned for the road, but it sounds like a race car. It really, really sounds just like a race car. And that means you're pretty much deaf. The great thing about this being Roger's car is that I can send you to his YouTube channel, which you'll find the link in the description. If you want to learn about all the minutiae about this car and what it's like to live with daily, check out Roger's channel and you'll find plenty of videos taking you through that. The good thing about that is that I can focus just on driving rather than telling you what all the switches do. So what else can I tell you about driving the car? Well, the responses from the steering are, pun intended, electric. It changes direction like a mosquito. It's just a very fizzy car. The steering feels a lot more connected to the road than the touring. Touring, you've got quite a lot more bobble going on, that 911 characteristic, but you just get none of that with this car, and I think that can only be attributed to the wishbone suspension. It does make a big difference because you feel at all times completely connected to the road. PDK gearboxes, they are absolutely incredible. The speed at which they change without upsetting the car at all, it is it's truly phenomenal what the engineers have managed to do there. Now this being a Porsche 911, the ergonomics are obviously fantastic. You can easily reach the touchscreen, everything works quite well. The one criticism I would make of the touchscreen is that there's so much on it that sometimes you do press the wrong thing. Who fancies a little bit of beans in Roger's car? Sorry, Roger. pretty rapid. It is pretty rapid. You get quite a savage snapback. The engine has got a real bark to it. You're getting quite a lovely, delicious mechanical sound and a roar. This car's a lot louder, a lot more aggressive sounding than even the Touring, which is a big surprise. I thought the Touring was going to be way more snarly and growly and raw than this new 992, but it just isn't. Of course those ceramics best in the world really really powerful stopping power and yeah you get the similar push that you do in the 911 turbo it's a good old shove I've got good visibility everywhere in the car except behind me the rear wing on this car really does hide 
the car behind you. I can barely see my car at all. And of course, if that's a police car, then that's not really what you want. Now we're coming up to a particularly beautiful stretch of road. So let's see what it's like here. Oh, you've got a beautiful wail from the engine. That's a good sound. Oh, immediate gear changes, obviously. Just the change of direction is what you cannot believe. It's so sure-footed. There are bends here that I would be a little fearful of taking up full chat in the touring. In this, just shrugs them off. Look at it, completely composed the whole time. In another 911, that car would have absolutely taken off then. This one, no, not a bit of it. So confidence inspiring. I can only imagine what the GT3 RS is gonna be like. I assume a lot stiffer and a lot rawer, but I mean, it's hard to imagine something rawer than this just gives you so much confidence you can really lean on the tires into those corners and you don't ever really think that they're going to break away second gear listen to it listen to that <laughs> it's so good it's so good damn sort of making me wish that I hadn't completely fallen out with Porsche now. Sort of making me wish I could sort of have one of these. I guess I could still buy one second hand. This has really opened my eyes actually to this generation. I wasn't that bothered about it to be honest before and I was quite happy with my 991. I obviously am still happy with my 991 because I'm never going to get one of these but it's a real eye-opener. You can really feel the development and you can really see what an accomplished car this is. One of the greatest all-round supercars that you can buy. I'm a little bit jealous of Roger actually because this is pretty fantastic. I'd probably prefer a manual because, you know, the PDK, as brilliant as it is, just does too much for me. It's a bit too synthetic, but you can't deny this is a fantastic car. And now it's time to take out my GT3 Touring. Let's see how it compares. Well, as you can tell, it's quite loud in here, but amazingly, not as loud as the 992, and that is a big shock. The biggest difference immediately is that this car does feel a little bit smaller. Inside here, the cabin, the, this doesn't have a roll cage, of course, so it's not as claustrophobic, but this car, despite that, still feels smaller than the 992. I know I praise the interior of the 992, and it is fantastic, but this one is somehow a lot more minimalist and simple to use. The touchscreen doesn't have any of the main car controls or functions on it, and things like your loud exhaust and your sports button and suspension are all physical real buttons down here that you can rest your finger on and press when you want to. Whereas on the 992, you do have the option of a button. They're harder to see and forward of the gear stick, and also you can control them on the touchscreen. One big difference between the two cars and something I never thought I would see in a GT car is that there is stop start in the 992. Yeah! And this one doesn't have that. Now straight away I can feel that the suspension, if anything, is slightly more compliant in this car, even over cattle grids, and the steering does not feel as sharp, not as alive. When you start waggling it around like this, you get 
quite a bit of actual sway in the car but it doesn't change direction so alarmingly like the 992. Now that really is pin sharp. This, it is quick, but there's a little bit more slush in there, which I think helps you try and keep control of that bobbly front end. Now, who fancies some beans in the GT3 Touring? Here we go then, manual gearbox, remember. Ready? <laughs> is about the same remember as the 992 there's not much in it and it doesn't feel like there's anything in it at all there's more drama in this car because of course you've got to move the gear stick you've got to interact with it you've got to stir that gearbox in order to get the best out of the car that feels exciting it feels more exciting than the 992 where you just have to do this and that's probably the reason why PDKs for a car like this is just not what I would go for. Now you can of course get the 992 with a manual gearbox so you can get some of that connection back to the car that this one's got. So that's why I don't put a huge amount of stock on that versus argument. So in a straight out beans blast like that, speed is very similar but there's a lot more drama in the way you get there in the touring. You feel more connected with the machine. And also, I have to say, I prefer the majority of the dials being analog rather than digital. I know digital gives you lots of flexibility, and in this car, one of the main dials is digital, but there's nothing like seeing proper needles moving around. And although the 992 does have its rev counter as a proper needle, there's just something nice looking out over that classic 911 configuration. You can definitely notice the fact that this car moves around a lot more on the road. It sort of follows a lot of the undulations. You're having to make little micro adjustments all the time. And when you pitch it into tight bends, you do get a little bit more nervousness and also you get a bit more front end movement. The 992 has none of that. So it really comes down to whether you like absolute super precision or whether you like cars to move about a bit and give you a bit of a fright sometimes. I prefer the latter. I've got better visibility in here obviously because I don't have a wing so I can see if there are any officers of the law behind me. Right, we've got some particularly fun twisties here so let's check out the difference between the steering. certainly the new car is sharper and it's more sure-footed at the front. This one you get the sense that you wouldn't be able to go around the corners half as well as the new car and you probably might get into a little bit of trouble sometimes carrying a lot of speed in. So overall having driven them back to back in these beautiful Welsh hills there are some improvements in the 992 no question if you're really pushing on hard but it's surprising how close the two cars are in terms of overall enjoyment. And this car, to me, represents a little bit more 911-ness than the new one. The new one is almost a bit too good. It's a bit too fantastic in all areas that it doesn't really leave any area for little foibles that'll make you fall in love with it as deeply as this one. This car's got some flaws, but as a result, it's got bags of character and I'm not sure you could say that the new car has that much actual character. It's very competent, yes, but I wouldn't say it's a car that you would build up an emotional connection with. To me, the first generation 992 GT3 is a stepping stone to the always better 0.2 generation or perhaps into the GT3 RS, which will almost certainly be a fire-breathing monster. Now you see, coming over that bend was a very different experience in this car than it is to the 992 GT3. 992 GT3 
came over that, didn't cock a wheel, stayed composed. This one was all over the place, frankly. What an incredible day it's been, testing these two Peak 911 GT3s out here in Wales. The land of the beautiful driving road and now the average speed camera. So now that I've driven both of these cars, what are my final thoughts and conclusions? Well, almost certainly the 992 GT3 was far better than I could have imagined. That new double wishbone suspension really did suck the car down onto the road, gave it far more composure, and it cured forever that 911 bobble and slight hesitancy and turning on tight corners. <laughs> And actually, it was a lot noisier than I thought. Oh. And it's a harsh mechanical race car noise. I thought this was going to be about as loud as a GT3 was going to get. And in fact, the first owner of this car sold it because it was too noisy. There is no doubt that in a straight out dogfight between the two cars, the new one will almost certainly get past the line more quickly. But this car is more fun. It's more frenetic, it's looser, it gives you more of a real feeling of driver involvement and not just because it's manual compared to the PDK. Now that I've driven both of them, I'm more than ever convinced that actually this one, the Touring, the original Touring is the one that gives me the feeling that I want from a 911. It doesn't have a wing, but it's still got a menacing presence. It's debadged. It's got various custom elements to it that I've added, but I think this one for me is the winner. Out of the two, the one that I would want to drive home in today is still this one. Sorry, Roger. That's not to say that the 992 isn't a stupendously capable machine. It totally is. It's wonderful in every regard, but perhaps that's why I don't like it as much as this. Is this the best Porsche I've ever owned? Well, in many ways it is, but it's, it's like comparing trousers and skirts, isn't it? Okay, so I've got the 718 Spider, which is brilliant for what it does. It's a proper sports car. I don't think there's anything better than that. So as a sports car, that's the best. But as an all-round high-performance sports car version on supercar, GC3 is the best. Huge thanks to Roger Bailey for bringing his car up here and for letting me drive it all day today. Obviously, he got to drive mine as well. If you want to check out Roger's channel, type in Roger Bailey into YouTube or there's a link in the description. I heartily endorse checking out his channel because if you love Porsche, he goes into extreme detail about all the latest models and it's a very useful resource if you're into Porsche 911s particularly. If you like what we're doing on the car guys please subscribe leave comments and likes there'll be another episode next week Beep.